Before I start, Amma, you had asked me a question about a verse which Swami Vivekananda had chanted um, at the World Parliament of Religions, one verse which says, uh, as all rivers flow into the ocean. Yeah, That is the uh, verse from um, uh, the um, Shiva Mahimna Stotra. It's a very beautiful verse. It goes, she had asked a question about this particular verse you find in, it's written that, Swami Vivekananda said that every boy or a Brahmin boy in India chants it um, that as the different rivers flow into the ocean, so do all beings uh, go to thee. So what was that verse? Um, so it, the actual verse is from the Shiva Mahimna Stotra, which goes like this. Trai Sankhya Yogam Pashupati Matam Vaishnavamiti Prabhinne Prasthane Paramidamada Patyamiti Cha Ruchi Nam Vaichitriyat Rijukutila Nana Pathajusham Rinami Kogamya Stvamasipaya Samar Navaiva So what it means is Three, three, uh, three the three Vedas um, Actually, three Vedic uh, forms, the Rik, Sama and Yajur, which also includes the Atharva. That means the Vedic philosophies, the Sankhya philosophy, Trai Sankhya, uh, Yoga philosophy, the Pashupati, uh, which uh, our Professor Nicholson spoke about, uh, Pashupati, uh, Vaishnava, the, the, the Vaishnava philosophy, all of them, Prabhinna Prasthana, the different uh, philosophies, different paths to spir of spirituality, they all they are all different paths to thee. And why are they different paths? Ruchi nam vaichitriyat, because our tastes, inclinations, mental makeups, they differ. Some like something and the others like other things. So, ruchi nam vaichitriyat, um, so there are different paths which are selected by different seekers according to their likes and dislikes. Um, and they all go towards thee, like all rivers rush to, uh, rush to the ocean. That's a very beautiful metaphor. Payasam uh, Arnavaiva. Arnava means ocean. You are the ocean to which all beings rush in different ways. Sometimes in winding ways, the scenic route. Kutila, or, um, or sometimes straight, Riju, but they all reach you in the end. So that's the verse. So yes. So, depending on the path, yeah. okay, when you realize, yes. okay, so you realize, okay, I am Brahman and all that, okay, so, but like when you're relating to the world, will the, depending on the path, Will the way you relate to the manifestation be different? Yes, it would be different. Be different. Yeah. Even when you said, I am Brahman, that also might not be true. Um, depending on a path, one might feel, I am eternally in the presence of the infinite. Oh, that could be a dualistic oh, see, approach. A dualistic yeah. Thing. yeah, it could be. Uh, or it could be a complete withdrawal. I am the witness of this entire game of life. Like a Sankhya, uh, con consciousness oh. and uh, the material nature. Or it could be the non-dualistic thing. I alone am, am indeed all of this. I am the one reality of which the entire universe is an appearance. That's the I am Brahman thing. And depending on that, it may differ. Some may withdraw entirely from the world. Some may choose to um, uh, enjoy the world as a manifestation of the divine. Could be on a path of knowledge or could be on a devotional path. The entire world is the play of my beloved. Was it in this class or some other class I mentioned? I think the gospel class I mentioned, Achintya Bheda Ved, where the entire, uh, all of life is seen as a beautiful metaphor of the dance of Radha and Krishna, of God and his beloved. So you are the beloved of God. And so the dance has three levels. One is at the transcendental level, it is Radha and Krishna. That, that's the Achintya Bheda Ved philosophy. Uh, at the uh, material level, it's the dance of the entire universe. 
from the Big Bang onwards to everything, the, the dance of the g galaxies and stars down to the uh, individual electrons whirling around the nucleus, whatever it is, that dance. And at our level, it's the entire dance of life from the beginnings of life, the, the individual souls going through animal bodies and evolving into higher bodies, going to other worlds and coming back. This entire arc of life until enlightenment, that's also that at, at, at our level. So at three levels, this dance goes on. What a beautiful view, vision of the cosmos. Yeah. At the level of the material universe, it's a dance, the physical movement of the universe. At the level of um, uh, our lives, it's a dance between you and God, entirety of life. Each life, is, think of each life as a, as a nice movement in the dance. And at the level of the transcendent, Krishna and Radha, so that is, that's the way they look at it. That's one philosophy. So it'll be different. It'll be different, yes, certainly. Yeah, it'll be totally different. It will be different. In fact, I'll come to you. In fact, Swami Gambhirananda, he talks about the three attitudes a person of realization, enlightened person, can take towards the manifestation, this universe, after enlightenment. And that too from a non-dualistic perspective. Do come on in. There's a space here. We really haven't started yet. So, in a non-dualistic perspective, even there are three possible attitudes he talks about. He has an essay called the Seva Yoga, I think. There he says, it could be that the enlightened person is... Um, absolutely not interested in the manifestation and wants to remain absorbed in the uh, non-dual Brahman. No interest in name and form. So that person would, even when the body is there, that person would say, I want to remain in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. But if you remain too much in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the body won't survive. It doesn't care. Because he has seen a reality beyond the body. And that's what Vivekananda first asked when Ramakrishna asked him after him, what do you want to do? I want to remain there. Because that's his real nature. As the, you know, the story goes of the seven sages who are eternally in meditation. So he said, I, that's what I want. That's one attitude. And it's very great. So Ramakrishna criticized him. Thanks to him that we got all this. <laughs> but, um, but from the highest non-dual perspective, all of this is just manifestation. It's just name and form. So to remain absorbed in Brahman is no small thing. It's a very great thing. That's one attitude. The second attitude could be that this manifestation is one of delight. So, um, Sri Ramakrishna talks about this monk who was an enlightened person who came to Dakshineshwar. Uh, people thought he was mad. He just came and st uh, stayed in his hut all day and night and meditated and meditated and meditated. Never, hardly ever came out and never spoke to anybody. But one day there were storm clouds in the sky. Um, over the river and the city. So it became dark as it does in Bengal during the monsoons. But then a strong wind came and blew the sky, uh, the uh, clouds away. And this monk came out of his hut and danced and, uh, with joy and clapped and said, Bravo, bravo, no, wah, wah. And uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna asked him, What happened to you today? Please give me a place to sit. Sit there, and don't block this. What happened to you today? You never come out. And he said, look how the clouds came and a strong wind came and it blew it all away. This is Maya. This is how Maya works. You know, the whole of samsara appears before you. What you think of your terrible life and whether it's a glorious life or a terrible life or a mixture of both. But there are masses of clouds over the, the vast blue sky. A strong wind comes and it's all gone again. So that's the second attitude that... Uh, um, it's a delight. It's a delight. Um, so there are crazy men of God in different traditions of, of uh, wisdom traditions you have who seem to be mad from our perspective. But they're mad with joy, mad with delight. There was another man who came, uh, who's, uh, Sri Ramakrishna said, people thought he was mad, he was dressed in rags. And he came, but he went to the temple of Kali and then he chanted a hymn to Kali. And the description is, it's as if the entire the huge temple seemed to vibrate with that chanting. And he seemed to be 
mad. Children threw stones at him. Oh, oh, children chased him and, and uh, taunted him. And he ran like a madman. But Sri Ramakrishna to, uh, said that he is an enlightened person. So Hrida, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew, went out to seek advice from this enlightened person. So, and at first I think Hrida, I think that man threw stones at Hrida to chase him away. But when Hrida persisted and said, how do I know I'm enlightened? That man suddenly looked at him, this wild eye person who seems to be crazy. He said to him, look, the water, the, the Ganges, the holy river Ganga, and the water of this drain, when the two are exactly the same to you, you will know that you are realized. Two are same to you, that means Ganga is not Ganga, the drain is not drain, it's Brahman. That, that's the, I'm giving the explanation. He didn't give an explanation, he walked off. That's the second attitude, an attitude of delight, of, of, of wild delight, because the, the one is appearing as the many. Look, um, like you're watching a movie, a circus. The third attitude is one of love and compassion, where you feel that I am Brahman. And I, myself, in all these forms, am suffering. Look. Then I'll try to help them out of suffering. So all the, the great avatars and the buddhas and the prophets, they are like that, this third, third attitude. Yeah. You had a question. Yes. So I thought if every character in the dream is a projection of me, so basically me as a projection, and I'm real. So what this here is, is basically uh, God's cosmic dream, and I'm just a projection of, of him, basically. So all of us are just appear, uh, are projections of God or Brahman. Is that... Um, we take one step forward. Who or what is Brahman here then? Who is God here? All of us. All of us. We're all expressions of Him. In your dream, when you saw so many thousands of people, you were also there in your own dream. Right. So, who were you in that dream? All of them certainly, but especially you were there, the one who was dreaming. You are there in a particular, you yourself are the character in the dream. So you are the reality of all of those things. So here, what this is saying is, Mandukya, the real you, the Turiya, is the one projecting all this. Including this person. You are not a projection of God's dream. You are the, the one who is dreaming the entire, this entire universe. But no, you did not say that. Do you remember your own language, what you said? <laughs> Freudian slip, ma'am. <laughs> so, why... See, we are, we are often, we, are hesi we hesitate to say it's my dream. Do you know why we hesitate to say it's my dream? Because we, we do not let go of our small personalities. That's why, as a small personality, to say that this is my dream, it's dishonest. And we are aware of that. That's why we hesitate to say, this is my dream. That's why. Stick to this. This method will work only when you listen. What are they telling you? They're telling you that there is one basal consciousness which appears as the waker and the waker's universe, which appears as the dreamer and the dreamer's universe, which appears as the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's darkness. That one reality are you. You as the waker, you cannot say that this waking world is my projection. But you can say that this waking world and the dream world and the deep sleep world are all projections of I, the Turiyam. The featureless consciousness beyond all of this. That we must try to grasp. If you don't grasp that, we are losing the central benefit of this. It's good to hear all this, but you're losing the central benefit. That's why this is the, if, you, if you grasp that, then the path to enlightenment is direct and short. If you feel, no, this is God's projection, then, then what do you do? What, what's next then? Tell me. Yeah, but what I meant, so, if I'm the 
character in the dream, but I'm lying in my bed. So I'm the person in the bed. So I, what I was trying to say, so if, if this is God's cosmic dream or Brahman's cosmic dream, that means in the end I am him. Yes. So that's what I was trying to say. Well, very good then. <laughs> very good. So we are on track. Good. Now let us start the class. The chant Om Bhadram Karne Vishnuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Stirai Rangai Tushvagum Sastano Bhihi Vyashe Madeva Hitayadayo Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Starkshyo Arishta Nemi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 So we are doing verse number We did 33 last time Akalpakam ajam jnanam geya bhinnam prachakshate Brahma geyam ajam nityam ajena ajam vibudhyati What a very powerful, tremendous uh, assertion. Now let's go on ahead. What, has, what is being said now is, in these verses, Amani bhava, no mind. So what is this no mind? In the terms of Advaita Vedanta, duality is samsara. Causality is samsara. And freedom from samsara is non-duality. Freedom from samsara is non-causality. Advaitam is freedom. Dvaita is samsara, duality. Non-duality is freedom. Advaitam is freedom. Ajam, unborn. Unborn means non-causal. That is freedom. Now, this whole thing about non-duality it boils down to seeing non-duality. How do you see non-duality? Atma Satya Anubodhena By realizing I am Brahman. I am the non-dual Turiya which appears as the dualistic waker in waker's world. Which appears as the dualistic dreamer and dreamer's world. Which appears as the potential dualistic deep sleeper's experience. But I am the non-dualistic. Non-dualistic in what sense? Like you look at the ocean. 10,000 waves. But how, much, how many, if you count water, how many? One. One. Uh, when the waves are 10,000 in number, how much uh, in water, in terms of water? One. When there are no waves, suppose it's an entirely still thing, how much? One. one. Yes. So one and not two. Whether you see the waves or you do not see the waves, it's still one reality. So in the same way, whether there is a waking world or a dream world or no deep sleep world, no world at all to be seen. But it's actually one reality, which is Turiyam. Um, now the question arises, which will start now, 34th verse. Hey, wait a minute. The experience of non-duality, if that is freedom, but in deep sleep we experience non-duality. Do we not experience non-duality in deep sleep? What, what that means is, there's no duality of I and this. Rem try to rem imagine what was it like in deep sleep. Blank. Even the fact that I am in sleep, that you don't think about it. You don't even feel it there. It is all reduced to one lump of featureless blankness. Isn't that deep sleep? But that's non-duality. There's no duality there. How is that different from uh, this non-duality you are talking about in Vedanta? How is that different? This is the question. So how is deep sleep different from non-duality? You are talking about Advaita, non-duality. But deep sleep is also a kind of non-duality. It must be non-duality. There is no difference there. It's also, all seems to be one blankness. Or you can extend it further. Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Where, through the process of Patanjali Yoga, you erase the experience of the world. You alone remain as the witness consciousness. 
you erase the ex no no particular object is experienced because the mind is shut down yoga chitta vritti nirodha yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind how is that different from this non duality you're talking about so that's the question specifically how is sushupti different from this advaita knowledge you are talking about verse number 34 nigrihitasya manaso nigrihitasya manaso nirvikalpasya dhimata nirvikalpasya dhimata Prachara satu vigyaya, prachara satu vigyaya, sushupte anyo na tatsamaha, sushupte anyo na tatsamaha. The mind which is controlled, that means which is, which is settled on wisdom. Nigrihita here means, literally means controlled, but controlled in what sense? Settled on this non-dual wisdom. Which sees no difference anywhere. Dhimata means the one with the with the knowledge. Dhi here is the with knowledge or intellect. Dhimata, the one who has this knowledge of Advaita, who sees no difference in reality. Um, even while seeing ten thousand waves, he says one water. Even after seeing ten thousand people in the dream, she comes awa awake and she says it was one dreamer. Similarly, even while seeing this entire world of plurality, seeing this. You can still honestly say it is that one consciousness in which all of this is appearing. So the nature of this realization is different from deep sleep. It, they are, the two are not equivalent. Na tat samaha. The two are not equivalent. How are they different? Deep sleep, sushupti. We fall into deep sleep overcome by tiredness, by exhaustion. We are overcome by tamas, tamas, the quality of darkness, inertia. We are over, and, and in deep sleep, we are shrouded by ignorance. I know nothing. I know nothing in deep sleep. Even I myself, I do not know myself. Even I do not know that I know nothing, that also I don't know. That only I can say after, after coming out of deep sleep. But in... in um, Enlightenment, when you realize I am Brahman, at that time, it's not that you know nothing. You know exactly all that you know right now. When you, are, when you know that it is one water, at the same time you can say that, yes, there are thousands of waves. The difference between you and the ignorant person is, the ignorant person says, there are 10,000 waves. Where is this one water you're talking about? Doesn't understand what water is. Here are millions of people, living beings and non-living beings. Where is that one Brahman you're talking about? The enlightened person says, don't you see? It is that one reality which is appearing as so many to you. So even while seeing everything, hearing everything, smelling and tasting and touching, thinking, understanding, remembering, all the functions of life go on. He sees that golden thread of unity underlying the whole thing. This is very different from deep sleep. Not only that. Once enlightenment comes, in deep sleep, there is a kind of non-duality because there is no apparent duality. And also, as long as deep sleep lasts, there is no suffering also. Naturally, who is there to suffer what? All the good things and bad things of life, they have not been erased, they have been put under a shroud of sleep. So, but in deep sleep, bijam, the seed of all, is say anartha bijam, the seed, of, the seed of all samsara, the seed of all unpleasantness and misery is there. Because it will come back. The moment you wake up, it will come back. Yeah. You come back to the limited existence of this body-mind, separate from this world. But for the enlightened person, it does not come back. Even when that person is experiencing our waking, it's still one reality, Brahman to, to that person. Even when that person is experiencing a dream, it's still Brahman. Everything is Brahman to that person. And when it is not experiencing anything of deep sleep, it will be deep sleep of an enlightened person is equivalent to Samadhi. Swami Turiyananda was once asked, um, or somebody asked about Swami Turiyananda's deep sleep. Um, this is Swami, I think, Sarvagananda, uh, Sarvagatananda he had asked. And uh, Nishyananda, who was in, in 
um, Kankal in those days. He said, yes, the Swami Turiyananda is to stay here. And um, there was a story he told of how there was a mad elephant which came and Turiyananda woke up just in time. He said, and he said, um, because you see he was an enlightened person. And this young person, young monk asked, asked him, so does it mean an enlightened person has very light sleep? Does <laughs> his descent? <laughs> And he said, no, he sleeps, but not quite like us. And he left it at that. At that. Not quite like us means his sleep is equ equivalent to Samadhi. So anyway, whether it's in deep sleep, whether it's in dreaming or waking, everywhere it is the same reality for the enlightened person. So this is the difference between deep sleep and enlightenment. Here, in enlightenment, notice, don't forget that all the activities of life can go on. In deep sleep, none of the activities of life can go on. In samadhi also, none of the activities of life can go on. This is the amazing thing. You can perceive all difference. And you can utilize all difference. You can see this is a glass, this is water, this is a body. You can pour the water into the mouth. All of this you can see. And yet know that all of it is Brahman. This is the amazing thing about, uh, about Advaita Jnana. The realization of non-duality. In one place, Anandagiri, one of the commentators, gives a very beautiful example of the mirror and reflection. I open my eyes. Imagine sitting in a barber shop. Mirror and reflected mirrors and reflected mirrors and multiple reflections stretching away. This way so many of you. That way so many of you. That, but you don't feel, here are 100 more customers. There are 500 more customers there. <laughs> it's all I. Stretching away to infinity. How many are there? How many do you see? Endless, countless. How many are there? One. Who is that? Uh -huh. And the amazing thing is, that one who you claim is real, you can't see. Notice, think about it, in a barber shop, all the people you see, I mean, except the barber, all the people, <laughs> people you see in the mirror, all those reflections you see in the mirror, they are not really there. True or not? Yes. And the one who is really there, you sitting on the barber's the, the chair, you can't see yourself. I mean, your own face you can't see because you can only see a reflection. Everything that you see as an object is an appearance. Everything that seems different from you and different from each other, they are all appearances of the one, which is the reality and which is not an object and hence cannot be seen. This is a very good example. I wonder if they had barber shops in Arundhagiri's time. <laughs> he gives this example. He didn't say barber shop. He says, you reflected in many mirrors. That's what he says. It's like that. But not just people. Living things, non-living things. They are all like reflections of you, Brahman. The advantage is, these reflections can be seen. They can be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched. They can be thought about, understood, dealt with, transaction. Love, hate, everything can go on. And yet you know it's one, one reality. That one reality in itself is not transactable. You can't do anything with it because it's not an object. It's a very good example. So that is the difference between Sushupti and enlightenment. Sushupti, deep sleep. In Sushupti, everything goes away into a non-duality, into, an, into, non, into a Advaita. It's a kind of Advaita Darshan and, and non-dual experience. Deep sleep is a kind of non-dual experience. So in that sense, we all have non-dual experience. But it doesn't do us much good. It's nice. It's relaxing. But <laughs> it is not enlightening. We come out of it. We come out of it. And there's no awareness. There's no awareness. It, yeah, it's all hidden in darkness there. We come out of it. It starts and it ends. There is no awareness there. Uh, or there is no, at least no thinking there. There is awareness, consciousness is there, but not uh, thinking, not reflect, not self-aware consciousness. And the second problem is, all the problems are still there, though they are not experienced. Bija means in seed form. I think the commentator, men Shankaracharya mentions in his commentary, Nanu sarva pratyabhave. 
he, the, the word nanu when he ever says in, in, the, in Sanskrit commentary it means hey wait a minute it literally means but if I say but suppose that's the meaning of nanu sarva pratyabhava in the absence of all cognitions yadrisha sushuptasya manasaha prachara tad just as in deep sleep the condition of the mind in deep sleep the same way tadrisha the same will be the condition tadrisha eva niruddhasya api pratyabhava visheshat when the mind is controlled and established in non dual knowledge this enlightenment so what you call it is it something like that then deep sleep deep sleep or samadhi and the answer is not at all settle down yeah so not at all this is what is called um sahajavastha by many yogis ramana maharshi called it a sahajavastha even while talking walking and apparently dvaita darshana in the apparent ex- experience of duality you can still say non dual when you look back you d- you woke up from your dream after waking up from your dream when you look back upon the dream and seeing so many people and so many uh, experiences can you not say from your awakened point of view it was all me yes but that yes. could happen because i heard your voice <laughs> okay <laughs> very good <laughs> yes i woke up from the dream and i examined it you popped into my ear <laughs> the moment you awaken the swami say is that Th- that thou art <laughs> whatever exactly whatever you see in the dream you are in the same way awakening here does not mean that you will sit up in some other Brahm, uh, bed somewhere in brahma loka here it means you awaken into the realization i the consciousness alone am appearing in this way it's right here and now and you will be able to say although they all appear different from me this body and all those bodies they all appear different from me or the mind appears different from me they are all nothing but me i alone with a name and form am this mind i alone with a name and form am this body i alone with other names and forms am are these bodies and minds you will actually see that yeah hold on no questions now okay statement Right. It doesn't take years or centuries or lifetimes. Very good, very good. So, that is that is very important. Yes. Mm. Mm. That is very important. That awakening takes just uh, awakening takes just an instant, five minutes, as she said. Yes. One moment, that flash of breakthrough. How long does it take for you to wake up from a dream? The story about Narada. who spent 12 years got married had children went through samsara so many troubles and then finally the disaster of the flood where he lost his entire family and then he suddenly sees krishna standing there you have been away for half an hour that moment he sees krishna there one moment which is more powerful 12 years of samsara in the dream or that one moment of awakening which is more powerful one moment, one moment. he may have been practicing lot of spiritual practices in his samsara all those practices but that one moment of awakening yeah so you have to listen yes you are <laughs> <laughs> yes you are kim tat sa pratyabhava visheshat kim tatr vigyam so the question is asked that there doesn't seem to be any difference between deep sleep and what you are talking about non duality you are talking about non duality deep sleep is also non duality So what's the difference kim tatra vigyam what's what's worth knowing here and the answer is naivam no it is not like that yasmat sushupte anya pracharo the nature of sushupti is different what is different about about deep sleep avidya moha tamo grastasya um antarlina antarlina aneka anartha pravritti bija avasanavato manasa what is deep sleep mind mind itself becomes involved goes inwards overcome by 
ignorance, darkness, with all the potential, hard disk still there, computer switched off, sleep mode, but all the um, uh, files are still there. Moment you switch it on, it will come back again. That is the nature of deep sleep. That's not the nature of enlightenment. What is the nature of the enlightenment? Atma Satya Anubodhaha By realizing the truth about the self. What is, this, what is the truth about the self? It, the waking self is not the real self. The real self is Turiya. Not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper. The Turiya. Then what happens? Hutasha Vilup uh, hutasha viplushta uh, viplushta uh, viplushta vidya anatta pravritti bijasya niruddhasya eva prashanta sarva klesha rajasa svatantra prachara quite different svatantra prachara quite different unique is the nature of enlightenment where by the realization of that i am brahman all of ignorance with, with all its effects is wiped out like a fire which, which is extinguished which is extinguished so like that then next verse and he says tasmat vigyatum he concludes therefore it is worth knowing the difference between deep sleep and a non-dual enlightenment yes then he further delineates the difference between deep sleep and non-dual enlightenment. Verse number 35. Liyate hi sushupte tan Liyate hi sushupte tan Nigrihitam na liyate Nigrihitam na liyate Tadeva nirbhayam brahma Tadeva nirbhayam brahma Jnana lokam samantataha Jnana lokam samantataha Beautiful difference. He says, Liyate hi sushuptetan The mind in deep sleep merges back, goes back to a potential state. Basically, goes into hibernation, stops. Na liyate, this is an important distinction. The mind does not stop in enlightenment. This is very interesting. Otherwise, many people would say, yeah, yeah, we are not talking about sushupti here, we are talking about samadhi. But in samadhi also you stop the mind, the cessation of the mind. The chitta vritti is, um, uh, it ceases, it subsides through practice of meditation. Here, he says the mind can function. Body functions, mind functions, all of it functions. Remember what he is talking about. This is an important point. He is talking about no mind. Amani bhava. And what is he saying? The mind is not merged. In deep sleep the mind is merged. Blank. No functioning of the mind. In no mind, he says the mind is not merged. Very clear. Big difference. Liyate tat sushupte. In deep sleep, mind is merged. Liyate means leaner. It means becoming merged. It becomes merged into its seed state. Which we experience in deep sleep or unconsciousness. What so called unconsciousness. But nigrihitam, when the mind is controlled, controlled means established in wisdom. This is the meaning we are giving it here. Because the control can have two. That's why scholars are a little, uh, there, is a, there is controversy over this no mind. If you look at the scholarship, there are essays written on this. Papers have been written. Nowadays, 1400 years after God of Father, there are scholars in the West writing, what does this no mind mean? And the two views are, one is, it means nirvikalpa samadhi, one meaning. Another view is, no, it means the mind can function. It means that all the time you know that it is Brahman. You know you are Mr. X or uh, Ms. Y. And you don't have to, when your mind is functioning, you're talking, walking, driving, you, at the same background of your mind, you know who you are. In the same way, the knowledge of non-duality is there. No matter if you are working, you are doing something, it, it does not matter. Uh, it does not have to be stopped. So no mind does not mean stopping the mind. It's very interesting that we have been, I have been here for more than two years and so many videos have been put up, uh, talks on Sundays. 
I gave one talk called No Mind. And that shot right up to the top. That's the most popular video. I think it has got more than 150,000 views or something like that. Yeah. No Mind. People are so interested in that. Everything else, it beats everything. It's a talk about this, this subject only. This third chapter of uh, Mandukya, no, Amani Bhava. But no mind does not mean what most people might take it to mean. Yes, it, it is really transcending the mind. You have found really something beyond the mind. You realize I am not the mind. And you are really free of the tyranny of the mind. And at the same time, you are free to use the mind like an instrument. You are free to use it. You are free not to use it. You are free to put it down when you don't use it. So, um, and somebody gave in a comment there. I had shaved my head just before the talk. Somebody gave a comment. So does no mind mean no hair? <laughs> that reminds me. The monks in the Himalayas, they have a unique sense of humor. Come, come. Who has got a seat free next to them? Raise your hand. Yeah. They have a unique sense of humor. So, there was a, a monk. You know, the novices have what is called the sacred tuft. Uh, shikha. Uh, so, the sacred tuft. Of, they'll have a tuft of hair like this. And had a pretty long one. Long, it went up to this. <laughs> so, uh, so, we used to call them antenna. We used to joke. The antenna. Which, which enables you to catch spiritual... Uh, Transmission signals. <laughs> and the monks, they would be completely shaven. So we used to call that dish antenna. This is everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I met a monk there in the Himalayas who was called Antenna Baba. <laughs> Why Antenna Baba? Because he had a dish, his uh, bowl, begging bowl, which he would on which he would eat, then he would wash it thoroughly and clean it. And then he would put it on his head, like a helmet, and then tie his turban over it. So he had like a dish, literally had a dish antenna. <laughs> and he would get, he would joke of course, that he would get information about you know, the TV transmissions from the different worlds, the celestial worlds, Indra Loka, Varuna Loka. And it would all be stories about where the next big feast is. <laughs> So that's one thing that monks in the Himalayas is always worried about, where the next big feast is. <laughs> he was a very good soul, I still remember him. Very simple. Um, you see, simplicity and spiritual life are connected. He was a very, very simple person. Uh, I still remember when we would sit on the chairs and on the cot and discussing Vedanta. Although he was elderly, older than all of us, he would always insist on sitting on the floor. And he would, I still remember him sitting there and looking very, very uh, guilelessly. He would listen to what was being taught. And uh, one of the monks advised me, I used to read a lot, surprise. But I, one of the monks advised me, uh, don't read, you'll spoil your eyesight. Read in the morning and, um, um, and meditate at night. That's, uh, so don't try to read at night, you'll spoil your eyesight. This, I still remember, this Antenna Baba, he took me outside, I went outside in the hut after the class and he followed me and then he whispered to me, what, what you are doing is right, what you cannot understand there, that means in the plains of India, you will understand here. So read, read. <laughs> what you cannot understand there, you will understand here. And you know what I was reading there? Ashtavakri, yes, but I had, first time I was reading this Bandukya Karika Advaita Prakaran, exactly this is what we are studying. For the first time I was reading this book. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, why did I say it? dish, dish antenna? <laughs> yeah. Now, this is called Sahajavastha. Ramana Maharshi used to call it Sahajavastha. Even while functioning, walking, talking and all of that, you know it is one non-dual reality. That's the difference between it and, and uh, uh, deep sleep. Yes. So it's possible to understand you can look at the sky and know it is not really blue. Not really blue. State. Yes. Here in this book it says, there is a difference between the condition of the mind of a sleeper and that of a gyanin. 
Hmm. In sleep, what is the difference between an enlightened person and a regular old us? Hmm. See, in waking, you've explained. Yeah. You sort of understand. Yes. In sleep, apparently nothing. But what happens is the difference between uh, us and a jnani is in deep sleep we are overcome by ignorance and we have the seeds of um, samsara in us. When we wake up it will still be this ignorance. I am different from everybody and that is potentially there in my mind in deep sleep. The mind is involved in deep sleep, is resolved into deep sleep but with these seeds. Uh, this um, avidya bija. That bija is not there for the enlightened person. Does he know? No, at that time he will not know. No, we also don't know. Yeah. Huh. At that time he will not know. That's why without that potential for uh, duality, if you go into deep sleep, it is equivalent to Nirvikalpa Samadhi. When you come out of it, you see it is the same, uh, same reality. So the mind does not function there. So he will not know that I am Brahman there. To know I am Brahman, you need a mind. To see your reflection, you need a mirror. So this is the difference. Wait, yeah, the, you, are, you, want, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, I mean the gentleman in the striped shirt, he said a few weeks ago, and that's another thing that I remembered uh, um, at 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> our dreams every night in principle tell us who we really are. If True. If you think about it, if you take it a step further, and that's what he said a few weeks ago, and then I took it a step further. What did he say a few weeks ago? Uh, I, I won't be able to put it in his words. He basically said, uh, God tells us every night in our dreams uh, who we really are. The dreams are like a practice. So every morning I wake up and I realize, oh. Right. Not like on Monday morning. Right. Mm. Now, you see, this is important. It's not that the dreams themselves are telling us. If the dreams were telling us, you wouldn't need Mandukya. Yeah. No. Everybody would know. Right. What is telling us is this Mandukya is telling us, that's the role of the Shruti, of the Upanishad. It's when we wake up. Not even when we wake up. No. Only when you wake up with the knowledge of Mandukya. Yes. Yes. That, as, that points you back towards your experience of waking, dreaming, sleeping. And when you reflect upon your experience of waking, dreaming, sleeping, you realize beyond that, you, you are the one non-dual reality, the Turiya. That's what Mandukya tells you. So with the knowledge of Mandukya, when you look back upon your experience, the possibility of enlightenment is there. Otherwise, if the experience itself, waking, dreaming, deep sleep itself was telling us this, everybody would be enlightened all the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shamiji, uh, I think in, uh, it's my understanding that in deep sleep, the difference between a regular person and enlightened person, enlightened person has a good advantage not to dream like garbage dream. <laughs> Every day, human being has dreams. If you see the wisdom you already had, you don't have time to dream this. You wake up, you never saw anything. To some extent that is true. I am not sure I'm thinking. To some extent that is true. Because a person who... Because they don't have wisdom, they cannot see those evil things. So to... Uh, for a person who is enlightened, you see, the nature of our dreams depends upon the contents of our minds. Our dreams are based on, on our samskaras, our conditioning. An uh, enlightened person is basically a person who has done a lot of spiritual practice for a long time and has gone through a process of purification. So the contents of the mind are to a great extent cleansed and you would expect this person to have better dreams. Swami Vivekananda said, why are you so worried about dreams? He said, I would look at the life you are leading right now. That also is a dream. And then he says that um, in, a, in one of his poems, he says, Let all vision cease. That means awaken. Awaken into what? Into this non dual reality, into the, re that, uh, the reality that I am Brahman. <coughs> that means 
right here in this life, awaken into this. This, this is what he's talking about. Or if you cannot, here's the interesting thing, what Vivekananda says, or if you cannot, dream but better dreams, which are eternal love and service free. Very powerful advice. Be enlightened right now. Realize I am Brahman. That's the game of life is an end at an end now. It will still go on, but you will be an enlightened person. But you say, I can't. Till that point then, what do you do? I have never heard a more powerful, straightforward, beautiful, sublime advice. It's still a dream then. But if you must dream, if you cannot break out of the dream, dream but better dreams which are eternal love and service free. So what is eternal love? It is unconditional and it is uh, to everybody. <coughs> All those you meet in your dreams, good or bad, inimical to you, friendly to you, unfriendly to you, indifferent to you, your attitude is one of love. Why? Because after all this study, you will, you will realize, I am all of that. No matter how they behave to this person, I am. Some, a newspaper editor in Lahore or somebody was writing against Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda at that time was touring. So uh, he was praising that editor. And then somebody said, Swami, but he wrote against you. And Swami said, just because a person is critical of me, can I not appreciate his good qualities? Right? So that kind of greatness, how do you get that greatness? You expand beyond a little self, this body and mind. So love, eternal love, forever. So in Vivekananda writes in a letter to one of, an American lady here. Um, he says, whether you stay with me or not, whether you continue in Vedanta or not, do whatever you, in love, you will in life. Remember, I am always with you. I am always with you. So, he says, in life or in death, I am always with you. What, what a great commitment. Mm -hmm. So, whatever happens in life from now on, I am always with you. Now, that is eternal love. And then, service free. Not a conditional service. I do this for you, you do that for me. No. I will give and not look back. For whom? For everybody. What kind of service? Whatever I can. When? All the time. Where? Everywhere. So service free and eternal love. So unconditional service. These are dream but better dreams. Yes. Sorry, does that mean there will be abolition in our dreams? So we can wish and will having better dreams? True, that's what we are trying, see? Whether you are in Advaita or not. But even in the dream stage we can, because another Swami said that really dreams don't mean very much other than if you have spiritual dreams, the other dreams can be disregarded. Can be disregarded, yes. But what he means here, dream but better dreams, he does not mean our dream state. He means this life, living yeah, this life. Yes, no, that I followed. Yes. In the dream state, we don't have volition in the dream state. Not much, not much. Happens. But there is volition in the sense that as you cleanse your subconscious mm -hmm. over time, the quality of dreams will be better. Otherwise, it doesn't mean much. You're right. <coughs> yes. In, in deep sleep, when the mind is quiescent, does time slow down? Time disappears for you. Psychological time stops. So if there were thought experiment, if there were two people, one yes. who is awake hmm. and one who is asleep, and they're both wearing watches that are extremely precise, hmm. when, this, when the sleeper wakes up, will there be a difference in the... Watches mm, what did I say? What does the watch measure? If you love this class and time flies just like that. Oh, it's already 5.30, it's over. And another person is bored to tears by this class. When will it end? <laughs> it's just half an hour. Now, are, is your watch and his watch, running, is his watch running slowly and your watch is running faster? Of course not. But the difference is in psychological time. No, what I mean, what I mean is, if you if you take Einstein's theory, of you're talking theory, about the philosophy of time. Then. <laughs> yes. But I mean, an astronomer yeah. flying at very high speeds when returning to Earth will find a different time hmm. from somebody who's been here. And let's not talk about watches. Let's talk about perhaps some biological markers that that change or that depict age. Let's say. Hmm. 
would age of a of a sleeper be less than the age of a, a waking person? That a bio biologist can tell you, but if you ask a Mandukya from from the from Godapada's point of view, in deep sleep, where is a body which will age? You must, you must appreciate the unique approach of the Mandukya. It's an entirely subjective approach. What is meant by subjective approach? Your experience. In deep sleep, do you experience a body which is lying on the bed? You don't. Even in dreams, you don't experience the body which is lying on the bed. That's a waking state perspective. You stick very closely to your experience in, in order to understand Mandukya. That, that question which you're asking is completely irrelevant from the Mandukya perspective. Do you see that? Does the waking body age more slowly when you are in deep sleep? When you are in deep sleep, there is no waking body. Has it aged more? That's a question you have to ask only after coming back to the waking stage. You will say that the deep sleep body, you can measure biological markers to see that whether the person who slept a longer time, the body aged less, and the person who is awake body aged more, probably would. We have all the science fiction ideas about putting people into hibernation and going across to different planets, you know, for centuries traveling in space. But Manduki would say that's an entirely waking state problem. The body which you are talking about is a waking state body. It's not there in deep sleep. If you say, no, no, it's there, it's on the bed, it's sleeping, then you're not even, the first step in Manduki you have not taken is to take the first person perspective, right? So it's an interesting question, but from Manduki perspective, it's an interesting scientific curiosity. But from Manduki perspective, it's of no consequence at all. Yes. So does time even exist when you are in deep sleep? No, it doesn't. From a Manduki perspective or Advaita perspective, time is the gap between two thoughts. One vritti and another vritti. If there is no vrittis, there is no time for you. It's only when you come back into the waking state and take a look at the clock. Oh, so much time has passed. I'm, I, I, uh, it's time for me to wake up. It's time for me to get to, get to office or something like that. But that's in the waking state. Take the pers It's not difficult. It's strange for us to think in the, that way because we are so firmly set in our waking state. We think this is the reality. And what is dream? In this reality, when I fall asleep, my brain does some funny things and I get a dream. That's also a waking state perspective. In this reality, I fall asleep and my brain shuts down. I mean, sh doesn't shut down. Mind does not function anymore. That's deep sleep. But that's not your experience. You do not experience dream like that. You do not experience uh, deep sleep like that. There was uh, another lady who raised her hand. Swamiji, this deep understanding that the lady just spoke about hmm. at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, how does one sustain those flashes of understanding? Hmm. Because, uh, you know, one does experience that deep understanding and one realizes it's obviously one is not enlightened or realized but how can one just sustain that mm -hmm. is there a way or just again by centering continuing yeah the did you hear the question it's an important question as we study more and more this question will keep coming back how do i sustain that one begins to realize that understanding is very vital to make a breakthrough in advaita vedanta and making that breakthrough, how do you sustain that? That is what in Gita we are doing, sthita pragya, of sustained wisdom, of stabilized wisdom. There are three things to be done here. One is, first of all, that wisdom, you have to notice something about that wisdom. This understanding is in the mind, right? It's the mind which suddenly understood, oh, it's like that. But then you feel it went away or it faded to the background of my mind. Now let me ask you one question. You who experience that mind realizing that I am the one reality which appeared as so many in the dream. And you who now say that understanding has faded away. That you, is it constant or not? Has it faded away? No. You, the witness of the mind having that 
instantaneous breakthrough. And you, the one who are asking me this question now, are you the same you? And is, it that, is that the real you? Huh. The real you does not fade away. You say, no, no, I'm asking how to maintain the wisdom about that real you. No, you're not asking that. You see, this, this very understanding which I've told you now, that is the wisdom. And to note that non-dual you never fades away. It's always there. Or let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. You ask the question, how do I, uh, how do I sustain that wisdom? Follow this carefully. Who is worried about this? Is, are you worried about it or your mind is worried about it? Mind. mind is worried about it. Sometimes the mind is not worried about it. I have got this brilliant understanding. Be guaranteed, within a couple of hours the mind will be worried about it. I, I, it is going away. <laughs> it's a mischief played by the mind. You need not worry about it. This realization that I need not worry about it, it's the mind playing a mischief. That is the deepening of that wisdom. A clarity will come there. That's step one. Three, to three steps I said. Step two is um, staying with it. Making a conscious effort to suffuse the mind with this wisdom. You know that word? Uh, marinating? Soaking it in? Swami Vivekananda would say assimilating. This I, which ne never fades away, I am that, I am that. Whenever the baby mind says, no, it is fading away, is it? That light which shines upon the mind which says it is fading away, is it? Is it fading away? You say, it has to say, mind has to say, no. It's as bright now as it was then. Stay with it, stay with it. And for that, so many methods, Vedantic meditation and all that we do, that meditation, meditation is for that. That is called Nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation. Second step. Third step is the overall work project of spiritualizing the mind. Letting go the anchors which tie us to our samsara. Purifying the mind. All the little worldly problems which we have stuffed the mind with. What will happen to me? Body ill health, relationship problem, um, world has this problem, so many things, thoughts and all of them are generated by the mind. That spiritualizing the mind is, is Swami Vivekananda said, eternal love and service free. That's a very good principle. But all the advice given by the great teachers, in Gita you will find long list of Qualities to be culti cultivated. Amanitva, madam, bhitva, mahingsa, kshanti, arjavam. Be, be humble. Um, um, uh, be straightforward, honest. Be self-controlled. All of those practice of the spiritual virtues, that's the third step. Which prepares the mind so that it will never again complain that it has gone away, this enlightenment. So three steps. No, uh, listen to this. Three steps. Very important. I'm giving you concentrated wisdom about what you asked. Three things. First, clarify that wisdom, that it never goes away actually. One. At least intellectually you will say, no, it's there. Always. It's the mind which asks, is it coming? Is it going? I'm getting new insights. It has gone away. All those the mind is doing in the light of you, the constant consciousness. That enlightenment, once it comes to the mind, it will never go away again. This first step is called Tattva Jnana. The second step is to stay with it as much as possible, morning, evening, using different ways of meditation. Second step is called Mano Nasha. This, in this Gaudapada's term, it is called Amani Bhava. Amani Bhava, no mind. Spiritualizing the mind. Third step is called Vasanakshaya, purification of the subconscious. Erasing the worldliness. Basically, you see, in terms of uh, Mandukya, worldliness is something that roots you in the waking state as this is the reality. Yes. So, Swami, the first two steps that you describe are ways of 
rationalizing. Not rationalizing. No, to the mind. You're convincing the mind yes. that there is more to it than, than the way your true nature is, is what, it, what you're teaching or what it is. We are convincing the mind and then we're staying with it. Yes. But both of those are exercises somewhat in kind of rationalizing or lo logically kind of convincing the mind. First one is using reason and insight. Second one is repetition, practice, staying but with they, it. They have that overlap. You're yeah. still using reason, right? And for the true realization is not reason. Right? It has to come from within. It's not just reasoning with yourself, you have to really feel it. So is it, would it be fair to say that the real practice is the third practice that you refer to, which is really purifying the mind, that's how that reasoning will actually sink into the mind. Because True. Otherwise, how it's just your rationalizing. We, we can, like, the whole no, and, and uh, that's why I, op that's why I, things, right? that's why I oppose the term rationalizing. Remember, you're, say, you're saying realization does not come from reason, it comes from within. Within what? <laughs> within the mind. Within the mind. Yes. Only within the mind. Yes. There and there are, exactly. And so there are three things to be done with the mind. For which purifying the mind, isn't that the one in the end, if we achieve that, then the rest would follow? Uh, would follow, but not necessarily. But that's the primary thing. Purifying the mind, Chitta Shuddhi, then focusing the mind, Ekagrata. And then knowledge, removal of ignorance. See, Advaita Vedanta says there are three problems. Impurity of mind, distraction of mind and ignorance. Mala, Vikshepa, Avarana. These are in traditional Vedanta. Mala, Vikshepa, Avarana. Mala means dirt. Conditioning of lifetime, lifetimes. Patterns of behavior and thinking and unquestioned um, you know, worldliness. This, is, this has to be cleansed. And all our spiritual practices are for that. The second one is distraction. Our minds are so, they flicker so much. And this flickering is connected to the impurity. The more impure the mind, the more it will flicker. The more pure the mind, it will focus immediately. In Uttarakhand, one sadhu said, in, uh, he said, Samadhi is easy. I will give you Samadhi in two minutes. But the condition is get a purified mind. Uh, get a purified mind. Samadhi to asan hai matma ji. Do minute mein aapka samadhi lagwa denge. Shart hai, shart hai chitta shuddh hona chahiye. Now, th that purification of mind, that condition, that is a lifetime's work. So that's, that's, the imp that's very important. That's definitely. And focus is important. And knowledge is important. Yeah. So here, so huh. Can't retain it, and that's the question how do you retain it? Yes, really, it is a journey of a lifetime to purify that mind. That's true, right. true, there is no shortcut. True, true, you really have to go like true, you can't be enlightened overnight. True, but also notice that you can be. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Jeevan Mukti Vivek it says that there are people who, of these three steps, there are people who do all of them and proceed in the traditional way, they are called Kritopasti. The classic example is Sri Ramakrishna, who demonstrates each of the steps to its maximum possible extent. But he says there are those who, by he says, by the grace of Guru or by the grace of God, make a breakthrough, and they realize I am Brahman. It, it's that it becomes very clear, and then, then, wait, 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 wait. Realize I am Brahman, and it becomes very clear. Then the problem is that. Um, is there, is there anything left to be done for those persons? And uh, we, in Vidyaranya Swami, in Jeevan Mukti Vivek says, yes. If they have not completed the other two steps to a certain level, they are, they are not yes or no. They have, they have degrees of purification, degrees of concentration. A certain minimum is required. Unless that has been done, what will happen is this. Even if you have made a genuine breakthrough, and what is the characteristic of a genuine breakthrough? It doesn't go away. You have no doubt anymore. You will not ask how to sustain it, how will it stay, it comes and goes. No, there is no doubt. It's like a constant sun which never sets. You just have to look inside, refer to it, yes, it's there. But then, you see, then this person is enlightened. No, not yet enlightened. Uh, this person, according to Jeevan Mukti Viveka, he says, Advaita Vedanta, what is the goal? The goal is Jivan Mukti, enlightened while living. 
you must be able to enjoy the full benefit of this enlightenment. What's the full benefit? What was promised to begin with? When you enter all of this, what's promised? Overcoming of suffering, attainment of ultimate bliss, ananda prapti dukkha nivritti. Can you honestly say at least to yourself, all sorrows of my life are gone and I am at peace permanently. Can you say that without any hesitation? If you can say that and it will be reflected in your face, in your activities, you will be literally be a saint. If that has not yet happened, then you are not yet a, an enlightened while living, Jivan Mukta. Vidyarnya Swami says it this way. He says, these people who get a genuine breakthrough, like this, what he means, not just a flash of understanding, genuine breakthrough. And generally their lives begin to change very fast after that. But this genuine breakthrough, what will happen to them? They at the end of this life will become liberated. They will never come back to this world again. Mukti is guaranteed to them. But while living, they may still be affected by the ups and downs of life generated by their past karma. Now that is not fulfillment of the original terms of <laughs> purchase. <laughs> That when I purchased Vedanta, it said it will remove all my sorrows here. All my sorrows are not going away. I suffer. Death and disease and failure and shocks of life make me suffer. In the pinch, I say, ouch. That should also, even to that extent, it should go away. So how then, what, what is to be done yet? That person should, this person who has had that huge breakthrough, tremendous breakthrough, that person should immerse himself or herself in intense spiritual practice. What spiritual practice? The same ones he was doing earlier. But there will be a big difference now. What is the difference? Earlier you were seeking. Now you have found it. Now you are trying to stay. Now you are trying to immerse yourself in that. Absorb it. There will be difference. Earlier bhakti, devotion for example, was for trying to realize God. I am devoted to God. My Ishta Devata, my Krishna, my Kali... <coughs> will give me the vision of God and I'll be, you know, full of bliss. So that is, I'm, I'm seeking a vision of God and therefore I'm doing bhakti. Here, the bhakti is without any reason because I know it's there. So automatic bhakti is there. Earlier, I was doing karma yoga for purifying my mind. Now, not, for, not so much. Now the karma yoga is because I realize all of them are Brahman and why should I not serve them? So all of this now becomes a all spiritual practice becomes in one sense alive now, lit up by that breakthrough. But that spiritual practice has to be intensified. You see that in the lives of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. One thing I've noticed, among the many disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, the young boys who became monks, these 16 here, after Sri Ramakrishna passed away, they all plunged into intense spiritual practice. And they were asked, why are you doing all this? Sri Ramakrishna gave you Vivekananda got Nirvikalpa Samadhi in the lifetime of Sri Ramakrishna. Many of them, we have records of how they had visions of their Ishta Devata during the lifetime of Sri Ramakrishna. So they were in one sense, in the sense of most people of the world, they would say, yes, these are enlightened people. And yet, why are they doing so much, so much spiritual practice? In mountain caves, in forests, wandering over, over the um, plains of India, uh, in the mountains and in deserts. <coughs> Um, begging for their food, meditating day and night. Why? And the answer, Swami Brahmananda gives the same answer. Swami Shivananda gives the same answer. What he gave us, we are trying to make it our own. Basically the same thing, stabilizing it. <coughs> Another, even in the most simple way, the Holy Mother, Masharada, she puts it this way. She gave Mantra Diksha to a initiation, to a devotee. And her way of Mantra Diksha would be amazing. Mantra Diksha is where you have the, the chosen form of the deity and the mantra is given to you, the Guru. Guru shows you how to repeat the mantra and visualize the deity. And the goal being, as the mind calms down in meditation, the visualization becomes more and more real. And finally, you have actually a vivid experience. The deity becomes alive and gives you that, um, it's called Savikalpa Samadhi. Samadhi of, of the divine form. But when the Holy Mother would give you initiation, she would say, here is your mantra and see my child, this is God in your chosen form. And you'd actually have a vision of God in that, that moment. <laughs> Maybe for the only time in your life. <laughs> All the practice might not bring you to that. And then the first time she gives, look here. And many of them, they said, we actually had the vision of God in that particular form. But now, do it yourself. 
So one person asked, suppose I don't do it. I've taken the mantra from you. Now suppose I don't do anything. I've taken mantra from you, mother. I don't need to do anything. And she says, no, my child, you don't. At the end of your life, she would modestly say, Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna will come for you at the end of your life. Which means mukti, liberation. But, then she adds, but if you want to enjoy bliss in this life while living, you need to practice. This is the answer to your question. We need to practice. Even after, you see, you, all this might seem intellectual. But what Holy Mother gave was a direct mystical experience. After that also she says, rest of your life you need to practice to get that joy, to sustain that. Otherwise it won't, uh, samsara will again sweep over you. But remember it is done for you. You have taken mantra diksha from me, at the end of your lives it will come. Vidyarnya Swami says, if you have got that breakthrough and you do not do anything else, still life will toss you up and down. Maybe less than anybody else. Now you know, the other person doesn't know. But still you will be tossed up and down. But at the end of your life, this is your last life. Vidyaranya says. What he says in philosophical language, Holy Mother puts it in very simple, homely language. Yeah. What else would I, what did I want to add? Mm. So th this is it. My point here is, a breakthrough is actually possible. Many sadhakas get it. And all of us, to some extent, we have got different breakthroughs of different strengths. And we will keep getting it. After that breakthrough also, spiritual practice is necessary. And that breakthrough can come without complete purification of the mind. Sometimes the clouds part and a ray of the purest sunshine comes through. And then it gets covered over again. We need to remove the clouds over time. Yes. Swami, <clears throat> I understand what the teaching says that I am Brahma. And that who I think I am at the moment right now is pure dream. And the teaching says there's nothing pre for me to do because I'm already perfect. Uh, what my confusion is, is why engage in a spiritual journey? I'm already perfect. If you're already perfect, if you feel that, you don't have to engage in a journey. Why would you engage in a journey from perfection? Anywhere that you go will be imperfection then. I, I don't feel that, but I understand the teaching is saying it's this illusory self that has the feeling. Right. So why should this illusory self, I mean, why, why bother putting this illusory self through all this? Because the illusory self feels a problem. And if it's a real problem that the illusory self feels, then the illusory self needs to take an illusory hike. <laughs> <laughs> but, so my illusory self is coming to the conclusion though that I don't need to. Right. If you don't need to, then you don't need to, really. What Sri Ramakrishna would say, what Gaudapada would say to that, if you honestly at the depth of your heart you feel that and you are at peace with it, what else do you need? If I honestly feel, not that the book tells me I'm perfect, I feel completely imperfect, but the book tells me I'm perfect, then we need to do something about it. But I really honestly think that in my real nature as Brahman, no, it's true. Right now it's true. In my real nature as Brahman, which I'm beginning to understand, it's perfect. It is all right. Nothing has to be done there. There, if you try to do anything, you'll go away from perfection. Any change you make to perfection is imperfection. Isn't it? So, that is true. But the answer would be that as long as you feel honestly within myself, there is something lacking. Something yet to be done. I understand this. I will say intellectually understand it. But I am still troubled by temptation. I am still troubled by fear. The two great problems, Raga Dvesha, attraction and repulsion. I am still troubled by it, even in the least degree. Then there is something to be, let's be honest, let's, there is something, the shoe pinches, I know where the shoe pinches. It has to be worked out. And Vedanta allows for that. There is a whole range in which you can pinpoint where is the problem. Is it a problem in the conditioning of the mind? Is it a problem of focus with the mind? I cannot stay with it. Is it a problem in understanding how am I perfect? How am I Brahman? What is Brahman? That's a level of Jnana, problem at the level of knowledge. There is a problem at the level of focus. That's a 
solution will be meditation. There's a problem at the level of conditioning of the mind. Solution will be purification of the mind. True. Wait, let me just go ahead. Hmm. Just one clarification. In the three steps you just spoke, uh, how does it relate to the Tattvat Aprachyuto <coughs> in the Chobhavat that you talked about? Tattvat Aprachyuto Bhavat. Yeah. That is at the level of uh, Jnana. So it's, with respect to the three steps, where does it fall? Jnana, at the, at the Tattva Jnana, at the, at the highest level, yes. Wait, now, now let us go on to verse number 36. 36. 36 is an important verse, that's why I want to do it. Now he is talking about Brahman, Turiya, the ultimate reality, which you are. He's talking about you here, folks. 36. Ajam Anidramaswapnam. Ajam Anidramaswapnam. Anamakam Arupakam. Anamakam Arupakam. Sakrid Vibhatam Sarvagyam. Sakrid Vibhatam Sarvagyam. No Pachara Kathanchana. No Pachara Kathanchana. One of Another very beautiful verse in this chapter. Your real nature, Turiya. What are you? The self-realization is talking about what are you? Ajam, unborn. Anidram, beyond sleep. Aswapnam, beyond dream. Anamakam, ana arupakam, beyond name and form. So what does this mean? Ajam means... Birth relates to the physical body. So ajam means I am not the physical body, unborn. Who, what is born? The physical body is born. If I am unborn, then I am not the physical body. One. Aswapnam, dream. Dream relates to the subtle body. So the subtle body has dreams. If I am beyond dream, I am not, I do not have dreams, then I am not the subtle body. Two. Anidram, no sleep. Sleep relates to the causal body, deep sleep, karana sharira. If that's so, then I'm, I, I'm not the causal body. I, the self, am not the gross physical body, subtle body, causal body. Be, no birth, no dream, no sleep. Then what am I? I am the consciousness in which these three bodies function and give rise to these experiences. Born, dreaming, sleeping. This is in one phrase, unborn, no, uh, uh, no birth, no sleep, no dream. He sums up the entire Mandukya Upanishad. What was the Mandukya Upanishad? What does it say? That there is the waker and the waker's universe. With this physical body, I interact with the physical universe. This is called waking state. Then I fall asleep. In my dreams, in the mind itself, I generate a whole world. In my mind, I have a world of dreams. That's the subtle state. And then that also shuts down. It retreats to what is called a seed state, causal. Seed state is causal state. Blankness. But it's a seed because everything will come back again. It will sprout. So that is called causal state. And beyond all three, you are the fourth, the so-called Turiya. The consciousness which experiences all three. Right here, right now, you don't notice it. Just no, It promises notice it, you will be free. So uh, this is what he is saying. Look. He just said it straight away. Ajam anidram maswapnam anamakam arupakam with beyond name and beyond form. <coughs> beyond name, what is the name? Gross. Do you remember this physical universe? The name is A. Uh. Subtle dream universe. What is the name? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and the causal universe, what is the name? Mm. Put them together, a uh, um, uh, om. om. Yeah, we are very good. You remember. <laughs> that is the essence of the entire first chapter. Om. Anabakam. And then what are you? Are you a uh, or u uh, or um? None of them. You are the silence beyond the om. Anabakam. And what these names refer to? Waker and waker's world. Dreamer and dream world. Deep sleeper and deep sleep darkness. Arupakam. You are beyond all these also. They, they are not beyond you. They appear in you and disappear in you. In ignorance, you think you are that. 
In enlightenment, you realize you are the one in which these appear, play around and disappear, leaving you like the vast blue sky, unaffected by the presence of the clouds, by the disappearance of the clouds. The sky is unaffected, right? Then, then what am I? And remember, anamakam arupakam. This is maya. Nama rupa is maya. You are neither, you are not maya, you are beyond maya. Then what are you? Very beautiful phrase. Sakrit vibhatam. Ever shining. You are ever shining. What, mean, what does it mean? You have a very shining face? No. Your consciousness, your light, your consciousness. You are that unchanging consciousness. Not the changing body, not even the changing mind. But that unchanging awareness you are. Swami, when will I become that? That sounds nice. You are that. You are the one who is asking that. <laughs> that unchanging awareness. Sakrit vibhatam. This imagery is very beautiful. Sakrit means flash. But it's not a momentary flash. Imagine a flash of lightning which is eternal. Not flashing continuously. Just one flash ever radiant. Sakrit vibhatam. Sarvagyam. Sarvagyam normally means omnis omniscient. All-knowing. Sarvagyam means all-knowing. But here it does not mean all-knowing. It means sarvascha gyascha. You are all. Sarva. How? As existence. Everything that exists must have existence. Everything that is a golden ornament must be gold. Gold is all the ornaments. How? Because it is the reality of all the ornaments. Clay is all the pots. How? It is the reality of all the pots. You are all. How? You are existence. Are you not all that there is in your dream? Whatever you see in your dream, are you not all of that? Sarva. You are all. And Gya. Gya means knowledge. Here it means consciousness. You are awareness and you are existence. That is the very stuff of, of uh, the universe, of experience. Sarvagyam. No prachara kathanchana. And in that, that fourth, there is no transaction. No prachara means no transaction. No lending and buying and selling. No, no taking and giving. No enjoying and suffering. No birth and date, death. No give and take. Nothing. There is transaction in waking. There is transaction in, in dreaming. In deep sleep also transaction comes to an end. Transaction means any kind of dealing, any kind of activity. Comes to an end but deep sleep has the seed of transaction. It will come back again. But you, the basic, the consciousness underlying it, there is no transaction there. But you said Swami, all these waking, dreaming, deep sleep, they go on in you. So those transactions are still in you. No, they do not go on in you. They only appear to go on in you. You just said they go on in you. It's like the movie on a screen. You can watch the movie on the screen. The characters may be there. They may be um, loving, fighting, um, talking, driving, uh, whatever they are doing. And yet you are, while watching all of that, you are justified in saying there are no characters there. And there is no love and hate there. There is no war and peace there. There is no activity going on there. Are you not justified in saying that? From the point of view of the screen, there is only screen and light. From the point of the view of the movie, it's all there. But without the screen, there is no movie. Without the movie, there can be a screen. Screen can exist as a screen. No movie. Similarly, from in you, the consciousness, the dream of this life, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, they are all dreams. In fact, Gaudapada says, there are only two states. Movie on, movie off. <laughs> movie on, he calls it waking and dreaming. What you call waking and what you call dreaming, for him it's dreaming. Dream is also a dream, waking is also a waking. And deep sleep is sleeping. Movie off. Movie on, movie off. In both cases, movie only. What he is pointing is, your, neither of them are import important. <coughs> what is important is the background. You the background. Now enjoy the movie. No, no, I don't like the movie. Switch it off. <laughs> but why don't you like the movie? It's only when you consider the movie to be real, you might say, this is great, let it go on. This is horrible, stop it. But when it's a movie, even the horrible movie, the more horrible it's done, especially if it is well done, you will say, great, let me see another show. 
Isn't it? Then even the horrible and the good both become art to you. Yes. So that is possible. That is called no pachara kathanchara. There is no transaction. It, is, it refers to the, this whole thing is a summary of the seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad. Nanta pragyam, nabahish pragyam, not the, uh, not the deep sleeper, not the dreamer, um, um, not, the, uh, not the waker. Adhyavaharyam, um, beyond all transactions. So this is the meaning. Now, this ajam, unborn, anidram, no, uh, beyond sleep, aswapnam, beyond dream, this has a deeper meaning. What I gave you was a simple meaning. Ajam means not the physical body or the physical universe. Uh, anidram, aswapnam means not the dream, subtle universe. Anidram means not the deep sleep, the causal universe. Uh, but a deeper interpretation is given by Shankaracharya who says, Ajam means, Avidya nimittam hi janma rajju sarpavat ittyeva vochama sacha avidya such a vidyat satyanu atma satyanu bodhena niruddha yato ajam. He says birth is due to ignorance because of, because of ignorance of the rope, you can say the snake has been born. But the ignorance has been removed. Removed by what? By the realization I am Brahman. Because you have, you have removed the ignorance by the realization of that I am, I am Brahman, then ajam, unborn. What is unborn? Brahman is unborn. Not only you, the physical body, but the entire universe is unborn. Without being born, it is there. Without being born, if it is there, then it must be Brahman only. Without being born, if the um, snake is there, then it must be the rope only. You see? That is the deeper meaning of Ajam. Then, Anidram, beyond sleep. Avidya Lakshana. Um, avidya lakshana anadi maya nidra what is sleep the beginningless maya is called sleep you are beyond that maya so anidram these are very the more profound meanings given by Shankaracharya then aswapnam swapat prabhuddo advaya swarupena atmana ataha aswapnam you have Awakened from the uh, from your dream into the reality that all is Brahman, hence you are beyond dream. This basically you are awakened, you are enlightened. The word Buddha, being a Buddha, that I am awakened. So, could you elaborate a little bit on the beginningless Maya? Yes. Beginningless. beginningless Maya means no, not in the sense of uh, being real. Brahman is beginningless. Brahman is endless. But Maya is beginningless but has an end. It's like when you go into deep sleep or when you go into a dream. Um, the dream is because of, of your, your fallen asleep. So there's a dream. And in the dream you see a world. If you ask, here is a person. Uh, so say I'm running, the example I give. I'm running in the forest. I'm terrified. I'm being chased by a lion or a tiger. And if I ask, where did this lion come from? From its lion parents. <laughs> Where did they come from? From their parents, the grandparents and so on. Where? Beginningless. The real answer is they have not come. So that ignorance which leads to this thing. Ignorance is always beginningless. Not knowing. If you ask when did this not knowing begin? Our Professor J.N. Manth used to give a very nice example. Uh, he, I, I remember. He gave a simple example. Beginningless Maya sounds very profound or it sounds like a slate of hand or something like that but that's not true any kind of ignorance is beginningless he asked uh, he asked the class do you know French and he said no so since when do you not know French when did your ignorance of French start I guess at my birth so you knew French before your birth no <laughs> so ignorance is always beginningless but ignorance comes to an end the moment you pick up a French textbook and start reading it comes to an end so that's what's meant by beginningless Maya. So Maya is not beginningless in the sense of Brahman being beginningless. Brahman is real and hence eternal, has no beginning and no end. But this is ignorance, unreal. 
It has no beginning, but it is an end. Yeah. Yes. Don't don't blame me. It's it's Gaurapada. Yes. Uh, uh, you were highlighting how science is concerned mainly with the object. Um, the current model is mainly about object and objects. Do you believe there's room in science for Vedanta as a subject, or does science needs to redefine itself? Science needs to. You're right. Science needs to redefine itself very badly. But they will not redefine themselves unless they come to an insoluble problem. And they, I think, I think, we are finally at the point where they are hitting a wall. In fact, in science, you are hitting a wall in this 20th, 20th, 21st century in every field of science. That conference we attended, some of us recently, in the new school, conference on unknowability. So you had a historian, you had people from literature, you had people from, uh, from life science, you had a psychologist, and most importantly, physics, mathematics. Only one who didn't turn up was the philosopher. <laughs> the philosophers know it all, so <laughs> there's no unknowability. No, she couldn't come. But, um, so in every field you are running into a barrier where you're hitting paradoxes. In fact, the one who gave the keynote address, John Barrow, he wrote a book called Impossibility. Um, that you run into these impossibilities in every field, especially, most fundamentally in physics and mathematics. Um, but let me come to, what is this crucial problem which will force science to redefine itself? When you use the word object, science is about objects, which means there is something called a subject, we take it for granted. But you know, very interestingly, science also helplessly because of its orientation, is forced to treat the subject as an object. Do you understand what I mean? You, you think you are a subject? How what does science think of you? You are a body, which is an object. No, I am thoughts. No, even your thoughts are generated by the brain, which is an object. <coughs> if, you, if science cannot reduce you to an object, science cannot study you. Science takes it for, without thinking, science takes it for granted that everything must be an object somehow. But science has to be objective. And it has worked so well till now. But here is the problem. What is consciousness? So there are four approaches. This is not from science. This is from a monk in the Himalayas who, <laughs> who gave four approaches. Consciousness and object. Object. Object creates consciousness. One approach. Who says this? Science. There is matter and energy and some of it becomes living matter. And some of that living matter develops sophisticated nervous systems and brains which are also matter, object. And which somehow generate, somehow, mind and consciousness. How? Don't know yet. We will in a, in a short while. But this we will in a short while, here is the breakdown. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. So hopefully you'll dwell on it. They're trying very, very hard to solve the hard problem of consciousness. But all the efforts, all the efforts, without exception, all the efforts are trying to, are following this paradigm. Consciousness by somehow must be based on some <coughs> object. Living brain. What are the objects? Many ideas. Um, there are, depending on the speciality. Um, we, um, yesterday, we saw, day for yesterday, Massimo, so he's a biologist. So he says, obviously consciousness is a product of living tissue. So um, that's where we find consciousness. So brains must be producing consciousness. Object. Information scientist. The most promising theory of consciousness studies right now is by somebody called Tononi. Tonini? Tononi. Um, yeah, what is it called? Integrate, integrated information theory, I think. Yes. But what is he saying? Consciousness is coming out of complexity. What complexity? Complexity of information and interaction of information. Something like that. 
object, again object. If you go to some, some physicist, someone like Roger Penrose, he says consciousness comes out of some tiny structures in the brain called microtubules. So take your pick. Everybody has an object. If you are a scientist, because from a scientist's perspective, there is nothing else except object. All right. This is one view. And this is not a new view. No, I mean, we have enormously sophisticated science now. But is, in principle, this is the exact same view they had 5,000 years back in India. They were called the Charvakas, the materialists. They had this view. Then, the exact opposite view is held by another group. Consciousness produces the object. Say, ah, oh, this is Advaita, not at all. Religion. Theistic religion. God created the universe. And if you ask, all of these religions will say, yeah. If you ask, uh, is your God a conscious God or an unconscious God? Everybody will say, no, no, it's a conscious God. So uh, every religion is a conscious. So consciousness produced its objects. A conscious God produced the universe. Theistic religion. God produced. Consciousness produced the object. There is a third alternative. Which is the ancient Sankhya and yoga philosophy, which says neither produce the other. Both are real, both are parallel, and they interact. There is pure consciousness. There are pure consciousnesses. And there is this entire objective universe. And they interact. Where do they interact? You should be interested in the interaction, because that's what you are. Right now, all of us, we are interaction of matter and consciousness. Your physical body, brain, all of that is object, and consciousness is there, you are that, that consciousness. That is Sankhya. Very sophisticated. That is in fact what David Chalmers is pus pushing here. He doesn't know. Uh, he calls it panpsychism. Panpsychism is actually cruder than what Sankhya is trying to say. Even that is not Advaita. The third view. Fourth view, what is Advaita view is, consciousness... appears as its own object. It is consciousness and consciousness alone. It appears as its own object, which it experiences as something apart from it. But it experiences it within itself. Object is an appearance in consciousness, of consciousness. And I will say, in a simple way, with all this thing which we have studied, in a simple way, if you right now, take a look at your experience and stop there, you will immediately say, this is straight away true. If you look at your own consciousness and look at the objects presented to your consciousness, you will see all your life has been consciousness experiencing objects within itself. That's what your life has been. Tell me any different. You say, no, 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 before consciousness, before I was born, my parents were there, before my parents and so on, before life emerged, there was this non-living universe and from that story. Are you saying it's not true? No, no, I'm saying this is also a story within consciousness. Deny that. Who is telling this story? Consciousness is. Can you not tell the exact same story in, in your dreams? You can. Yes. Why do you, in the, in the fourth one, why do you even need object? Wouldn't, I mean, uh, why do you need object? Because you... Wouldn't, wouldn't it just be see? Just, it's all just consciousness. It is. But, but... How you have to explain at all, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to explain our experience. You are experiencing life as conscious subject and object right now. You are awareness and in your awareness here all this is. Now you ask the question, what is my relationship as awareness to all the things within awareness? Then all these four will come. <coughs> the scientist will tell you, wait a minute, your awareness is unimportant. This what you see, this universe is the reality. It produced you. And it will snuff you out very soon. It is real. You are not. You are just a product, byproduct. You are real in the sense you are just a temporary byproduct. That's one. The other one will say, wait, wait, wait. Just like you, there is a big C called God who produced this entire universe and you also. Third one will come and say, no, no, no. Take your experience as it is. You are there and the other is there. The other is an object. You are awareness. That is Sankhya. Both are real. Advaita goes further. So the other is there. Have, 
is it ever possible to experience an other without your awareness? No. Never. The other has always been presented to your awareness, in your awareness, never apart from your awareness. And so, this is the fourth one. We'll stop here. I have another engagement. Uh, I, I, I didn't mention it. Well, you brought it up. Buddhism, if you say, take Nagarjuna's point of view. Nagarjuna's point of view will say, this object, objective universe is empty, shunyam. And so is the subject, empty. Shunyam, shunyam. <laughs> but that, these are very, 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 very unfairly oversimplified approaches. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu